On the outside looking in, they were the ideal, privileged, all-American family. They lived a lavish life. The children attended expensive private schools. The poised mother hosted lavish dinner parties. And the father was a very successful businessman and was an usher every Sunday at mass. To their extended family and their neighbors, they appeared to be perfect. Richard was a mysteriously successful and admirable businessman, and his wife appeared to be among the luckiest women in the world. But to some others, Richard Kuklinski was the devil, and in actuality, his wife Barbara was far from lucky. They managed to keep up this facade for over 25 years, hiding over 300 murders. And this is their story. I would move heaven, hell, and anything in between to get to you. You wouldn't be safe anyway if I was manager. And that's not bull, Dip, that's the truth. You could pull a gun on me, and if I'm mad at you, I'm coming for you. You'd have to shoot me to stop me. And if you don't kill me, you're stupid. Because the next time you see me, <laughs> I will kill you. child today's video is gonna be longer than sunday service on easter sunday at a black church okay if you hear the ambiance of blue crunching on a bone in the background i do apologize he just refuses to be quiet today so here we are Richard Kuklinski was born April 11th 1935 the second of four children in his parents apartment honey why weren't y'all at the hospital he was born in his parents apartment on 4th Street in Jersey City New Jersey and his birthday will make him an Aries another one of y'all I need the Aries just to look at me I don't know what's up with you and your people but child y'all need to get it together his father, Stanley, was a Polish immigrant who worked as a brakeman at a railroad. He was a violent alcoholic who would beat his children regularly, and then on occasion he would he would beat his wife as well, but it was mostly the children that suffered the hands of his rage. Especially the two older boys, Richard and his older brother, they were the main targets of their father Stanley's rage. Richard's mother, Anna, she was a devout Catholic who worked in a meatpacking plant most of Richard's childhood. She was also very often abusive to the children, like very abusive. Anna would beat the children with household objects, like whatever she can get her hands on, any kind of weapon of convenience. She opted for the broomstick most of the time and in one instance she actually broke the broomstick across Richard's back. Now mama had a temper because she also turned up on Stanley, her husband too. I guess they had a whole I can see a limo situation going on. In one instance she actually lunged at Stanley with a butcher knife. Just toxic. Now Anna felt like stern discipline accompanied by a firm religious upbringing which is make her children child the best little children that they could be. Anna very much so believed in stern discipline and firm religious background. That was her parenting style and that was the exact same way that she was raised. So that's really like all she knew. She raised her children in the Roman Catholic Church where little Richard became an altar boy. One night when Richard was just five years old, his father Stanley had gotten particularly inebriated. He then goes into one of his typical fits of rage, making Richard's older brother Florian his his target now at the time Florian was only seven years old Stanley punches the young boy in the back of the head which he reportedly did often when he became drunk like that was that was the thing he would get drunk and punch Florian in the back of the head and on this particular day his abuse resulted in the death of the seven-year-old. Stanley and Anna decide that they are going to call the police, but they come up with the story that he had fallen down a flight of stairs and gotten the injury, and that's what happened. The police ultimately believe the Kuklinski's story and don't look into the incident any further. Now, even though Stanley has seemingly gotten away with what he had done to Florian, he still abandons the family after this. He runs off, and this starts a pattern for Stanley where he would take off 
off and abandon the family for months at a time and then show back up drunk and disorderly taking his rage out on his children and his wife homeboy was just a, a nasty horrible person this incident with florian was one of the first and of course the worst memory that richard will form of his father and he had zero fondness of his mother from from very early in his childhood he he, he didn't like that lady at all Richard began exhibiting cruelty to animals at a very, very young age. He would take two cats, tie their tails together with rope and throw them over clothing lines and just watch them like rip each other apart, trying to break free. That was one of his, his favorite things to do. He would also throw cats into basement incinerators and close the door and watch through the thick glass oven doors as they would run around inside frantically trying to escape until they just ultimately succumb to the fire. He was a sick, sick, twisted child. He would also capture stray dogs and torture them in similar manners or the same ways. He didn't have a preference. It's just whatever stray little animal he could overpower and get his crummy little hands on, he would do these sick, twisted things too. Now, Richard was bullied not only in his home, but also in the streets and in school which was part of the reason that he dropped out in the eighth grade at the age of 14. so during the same year that he had dropped out of school he runs into his his local bully one day he picks up a wooden stick in an effort to i guess defend himself now according to richard he had no intention of fatally injuring the boy he just he started hitting him with the wooden stick and he couldn't stop and by the time he did stop little charlie lane was no longer moving he immediately runs back to his family's apartment and although the boy is discovered very soon after the incident took place there wasn't enough evidence or anything at the crime scene to link richard to the crime and so the police never connected him to to the incident now little richard he grew into a giant of a man he was over six foot five 300 pounds he was a pretty big guy and despite his preferred solitude he got out and mingled with the ladies a little bit his first marriage was to a lady named linda who was nine years his senior the two have two sons together richard jr and david and everything was all good until richard secured a job at a trucking company and he meets a lady by the name of barbara barbara was a secretary at the trucking company he falls for barbara his marriage to linda is dissolved and then he and linda marry in 1961 but their union wasn't some whirlwind romance some oh i took your man type of fairy tale that's not a fairy tale whatever honey it was a mess okay because before the marriage barbara had reached a point where she no longer wanted to date richard and she tells him that she feels like they should see other people and he reacts by literally stabbing her in the back and unfortunately this made barbara afraid to leave him and then she becomes pregnant by him and so her family to protect her honor they urged her to go ahead and marry him they didn't want her to have a child out of wedlock and bring shame to the family and so she ends up marrying him and being stuck with his ass but we'll get there once married richard he got worse he beat barbara so badly and so often that she actually had three miscarriages before she welcomed her first child with richard one of the beatings actually resulted in a partial birth when barbara reached the hospital her baby's leg had breached barbara was five months pregnant with what would have been a son the two do eventually go on to have two daughters together merrick and Kristen, and then a son that they named Dwayne. richard was very up and down as a father and a spouse barbara described richard's behavior Behavior is alternating between good Richie and bad Richie. Good Richie was a hard worker. He was a provider. He was an affectionate father, a loving husband. He enjoyed time with his family. Their daughter Merrick became seriously ill shortly after birth and good Richie stayed up all night, night after night caring for her and watching over her. He just loved his family so much. He was like the ideal family man, right? They lived a very privileged life. The children, they attended very expensive in private schools the family would host these extravagant events and barbecues outside near their pool richard would spoil his family with gifts 
He showered his wife in Christian Dior, which she apparently loved. He bought his daughters diamonds and jewelry. The family frequented the most expensive restaurants. They went on the most expensive family vacations. They went to Disney World. Like the kids literally had everything. They also would purchase a new car every six months. They had it going on. They had a reputation just for being damn near the perfect family. They attended mass every week where Richard was an usher every Sunday. Now in contrast, Bad Richie who would appear at very irregular intervals. Sometimes he would pop up every other day. Sometimes he would disappear for months and they would get good Richie for months on end and then all of a sudden Bad Richie would pop back up. Baby, they should have been waiting on Bad Richie with a baseball bat. Bad Richie was prone to unpredictable fits of rage. He would smash furniture, break things. He would yell and just act an ass and during these periods he was very abusive to barbara he gave her countless black eyes one time he broke her nose but he was not physically abusive to the children he reportedly went to great lengths to keep his hands off of his children sometimes he would even hit himself in an effort to keep from hitting his child honey they said one time he hit himself in the face so many times that he knocked himself out in an effort to keep from hitting the kid now, while he did go through those lengths to keep from physically harming them, the emotional abuse he inflicted on them was just like, sir, it's just as bad. Merrick was admittedly his favorite child. She was his favorite daughter. She was the apple of his eye. And even she got it pretty bad on one occasion where she came home late in an effort to punish her. He kills her dog right in front of her. Barbara, she was terrified of her husband, but she finally reached a point where she was just like, you know what, enough is enough. I'm gonna tell his ass I'm leaving. I can't do this anymore. She tells him that during an argument in a car and he responds by jabbing her in the side with a hunting knife. And she said that the hunting knife was so sharp, she didn't even feel the blade go in. It was kind of like an aftershock, like motherfucker, did you just, did you just stab me? She tells him that he belongs to her and honey if he couldn't have her no one else could he threatens her life and the life of her family if she ever did try to leave him and when barbara began to scream in anger he knocked her unconscious in the car what's so bad about this is the kids had go bags packed to grab and flee in the event that richard fatally injured barbara Now, on the outside looking in, the family looked perfect. Richard's extended family, as well as his Dumont, New Jersey neighbors, they had no idea any of this was going on. They were completely unaware of all of Richard's shenanigans and instead believed him to be this nice, gracious businessman who they looked up to. They thought he was just this great business guy. He was nice. He hosted the events and fed the people in the neighborhood and he was just that dude. He was someone that a lot of people in the neighborhood looked up to. Now, Barbara, she suspected that at least some of her husband's income was due to illegal activities, due to their lifestyle and large amounts of cash that he would often possess. But she had a don't ask questions philosophy when it came to her husband and his business and his money. She never asked about any of his business trips or any of his business partners that he would sometimes speak of when he would suddenly get up in the middle of the night to leave on a business run she never questioned it she just honey she just act like she didn't feel the other side of that mattress jiggling she just minded her business now at one point after him leaving the trucking company at which they met he was working at a film lab in manhattan now while he was working here he had unlimited access to master copies of popular films and cartoons and all of that jazz he started to bootleg them he would make copies of them and sell them on the side and when homie realized that um he can make a lot more money off the ones of the adult entertainment persuasion he began bootlegging those and that's when he really started to make a lot of his side money. Sis was also a scammer. He had put together this little gang who specialized in stealing brand new Corvettes and carrying out burglaries. He had tried to start up a check writing fraud business but uh, he got caught when he wrote that bad check and Sis 
was processed and fingerprinted down to the jail, but charges were dropped when he agreed to pay the money back. He also supplemented his income by becoming a contract killer for the mafia. Homie was an all-purpose criminal. The illegal adult films, staging robberies, and handling those that the mafia felt had wronged them or owed them, Honey, he was out here doing it all. Now, his way of doing business and his ability to consistently bring in money to the mafia, it really earned him a lot of respect and got him the attention of like the big time crime mafia families. I ain't gonna name drop them child and then I go missing. Mm -mm. Y'all know I'm already nervous about Portuguese speaking as Pedro. I ain't got time to be watching out for everybody. Hell, I just got Robert off my back, I think. Now, with all the crime he had going on, being a hitman was actually his favorite his favorite job. He was very enthusiastic about his new position. He would take on an extracurricular killings child just for research and practice and really to satisfy his own little taste for murder. He began taking periodic trips down to New Jersey and New York City prowling the Upper West Side of Manhattan for victims. Often his target were people who annoyed him. He would go out to bars and if anybody rubbed him the wrong way or stepped on his brand new white Air Force Ones, then he would use them as practice. His methods, they vary just as much as his victim selection. Because the crimes and the MO and the victims were so random, the police had a hard time pinpointing who it was and they did not even believe that these rash of crimes were all the same person they did not believe that this was the work of the same man he used everything from ice picks to brass knuckles to hand grenades like sis was just out here doing whatever according to richard a nasal spray bottle filled with cyanide was his favorite method like he would get up on you and squeeze it and be gone and you be gone too but a different kind of gone. Now, Richard was working for two crime families at once and his willingness to take on any task, any job without hesitation and his enthusiasm and just how much he enjoyed what he did, it disturbed even his colleagues who did the same thing. They began to refer to him as the devil himself. Like, it's bad when other hit me and shy. They just like, girl, you too much. He was already in good with like the top crime families, but his reputation as being just so ruthless List, it got him the attention of like the most elite of the crime world. No matter how gruesome or how terrible the request was, he never turned down a job. Like he wanted to do anything. He only had one rule and that was no women and no children. Beyond that, he felt like anything was fair game and he showed no mercy. There was a man, he was begging and pleading and uh, and praying, I guess. He was pleased God and all over the place. So I told him he could have a half hour to pray to God. And if God could come down and change the circumstances. But God never showed up. And he never changed the circumstances. And that was that. It wasn't too nice. That's one thing I shouldn't have done that one. I shouldn't have done it that way. This was one of the only times that Richard Kuklinski ever showed any type of remorse. It was just because he was an asshole about it and let the man pray. Like that is kind of fucked up. You let this man pray for 30 minutes and tell him if his God shows up, you won't hurt him. See, that is why they refer to Sis as the devil himself. It was also particularly clever when it came to avoiding the authorities and concealing the identities of his victims. He would remove their fingers and their teeth in an effort to conceal their identity. He would melt the bodies in these huge oil drums or he would put them in junkyard cars and leave them there for them to be crushed. Sometimes he would throw them in the Hudson River. Sometimes he would abandon them in mine shafts. Like he had an array of disposal techniques. Now during this time, in 1970, his younger brother Joseph lures a 12-year-old girl to the rooftop of a building, a five-story building, where he forces himself on her and throws her, along with her dog, off the top of the building. Sick bastard. Now, the dog was alive when he threw them off the roof, and so the dog's cry when he hit the ground caught people's attention who immediately alerts the police and the police 
very quickly apprehend Joseph. Dumbass. He confesses immediately and then he's sent to Trenton State Prison for th for 33 years. When Richard was asked about his brother's crimes, he replied, we come from the same father. <sighs> that y'all do. For 25 years, Richard kept up the facade of this businessman and family man by thoroughly compartmentalizing his life. He didn't tell his colleagues or employers anything about his personal life, where he lived, anything about his past, anything about his family. And he never socialized outside of work. He stayed away from drugs. He stayed away from alcohol. He never bought anything that the mob was selling. He made it a point to always just be an employee and never a client of theirs. And so that helped him to keep his family life completely separate from his work life. After 25 years of doing what he was doing and not being caught, he kind of got a little comfortable. He and his little crime ring, they began to make some, some mistakes. On February 1st in 1980, Richard is riding in the car with his associate, George Malbland. The two were headed to New Jersey. Now, along the way, the two get into an argument. I'm not sure about what, but during the argument, George threatens Richard's family and child Richard. He didn't play about his family, honey. When that happens, Richard suddenly, without warning, he brings the car to a complete stop, pulls out a 38 revolver and shoots George in the chest five times. This was the first homicide directly linked to Richard and it was only because George's brother knew that he was meeting Richard that day. So when he reported his brother missing, he also told police that, you know, that day he was planning to go see this guy named Richard, child, go check out Richard. And although he was made a suspect, nothing really happened right off other than, you know, them, them questioning him and thinking that he had something to do with George's disappearance. In 1982, Richard beats a man by the name of Paul Hoffman. Paul Hoffman is a pharmacist who frequented the store, which was a storefront in Patterson, New Jersey that was known to sell like stolen items. You could bring stolen items there and sell to them and they would in turn sell it to the public. Now, Paul hoped to make a profit by purchasing at a very low cost this drug called Tagment, which Richard claimed to have large stolen quantities of. This was a very popular drug. And so Paul was very anxious to make this purchase. He felt like he would make a lot of money reselling it in his pharmacy. He was badgering and rushing Richard to make the transaction. Paul and Richard, they meet up at one of the warehouses that Richard is leasing out. Paul brought $25,000 in cash. After Richard takes the money from Paul, Richard tells Paul like, psych this was a whole scam he then takes out his pistol puts it underneath paul's jaw and pulls the trigger now miraculously this only injures paul paul did not die so richard tries to shoot him again but then the gun jams and richard at that point resorts to beating him with a tire iron he puts paul inside of a 50 gallon drum fills the drum with cement and then boldly leaves it on the sidewalk outside of a motel behind a little diner called harry's corner in new jersey my New Jersey people, y'all, y'all ate there. Richard monitors the drum for weeks, sitting in the diner, acting like a patron, listening to their conversations to see like, if anybody suspected anything or was talking about the drum. He visited this diner every day for weeks and then suddenly one day he gets there and the drum is gone. He takes the seat like normal just to see if he can hear the patrons talking about, oh, you know, they found a body in a drum outside. Nobody says anything about it and Paul's body is never recovered. Like they just removed the drum and I'm not quite sure what they did with the drum, but child, it wasn't there anymore. Now during this time, Paul's little crime ring, they were coming under more and more scrutiny by local police. In December of 1982, Percy House, which was one of the members of his little crime ring, was arrested. Now Percy gets in there and he is snitching a little bit. He said, why do 10 when you can tell on a friend? Warrants are immediately issued for two of the other crime ring members, Gary Smith and Daniel Deppner. Now, Percy agrees to later testify against Richard and he is then placed in protective custody, but they're not quite ready for Richard to find out that Percy is an informant. And so Percy is still in contact with Richard from behind bars. Now in an effort to help Gary and David out, Richard advises 
the two to lay low don't talk to anybody don't go anywhere like don't do shit just stay here in this hotel he rents them a hotel room at the york motel in new jersey and while they're in the room gary is telling david like he's ready to turn his life around he's thinking about giving up this life of crime and richard had told the two not to leave the room don't visit anybody don't talk to anybody but gary snuck out to go visit his daughter and david tells richard and richard is not happy he began to suspect that gary was an informant or would turn informant and so they had to get rid of him now the three richard daniel and percy who is who's still locked up and still in contact with richard trying to act like he's not an informant at this point they talk and decide that Gary has to Gary has to go. Richard and Daniel then feed Gary a hamburger laced with cyanide. Homeboy eats the burger and nothing happens. Like they're like, sis, why aren't you dead? They're sitting up there and everybody is full and still breathing and Richard gets pissed. He tells Daniel that he can't wait. Homeboy gotta go. He orders him to take a lamp cord and strangle Gary. And so that's what he does. According to the forensic pathologist, Gary's dose of cyanide was lethal and it eventually would have taken him down if they had just waited. Had they allowed that to happen, Gary's death would not have been attributed to anything homicidal. But the ligature marks on Gary's little neck, along with the fact that somebody obviously intentionally tried to hide him, proved to investigate that there was a foul play at hand now daniel daniel also had a wife named barbara and they instructed barbara to bring a car to the hotel room so they can transport gary out of the room but when she fails to do so because she like me she ain't nobody's down ass bitch baby you want me to do what not when she doesn't show up, the two are forced to get creative. They decide to stuff Gary between the mattress and the box spring inside the hotel room. They put him there and then they check out as if nothing had happened over the next four days a number of people rent out the hotel room all of which complained of an odd odor being inside the room and even like the cleaning people they were like you know what there is a funny smell coming from the room but they just couldn't pinpoint what it was and no matter how much they clean like the room still had this odor finally after they literally cannot keep anybody inside the room like people are checking in and still complaining about the odor in this room the manager of the hotel he decides that he's gonna go investigate and check out this odor himself it does not take the hotel manager long to discover gary between the mattress and the box spring and then he alerts the authorities because you know i mean that's the proper thing to do right after richard and daniel leave the hotel room Richard takes Daniel to his future son-in-law, which is Merrick's fiance. We'll call him Mr. Fiance because his name is Rich and I ain't got time to be confused between Rich and Richard. He takes Daniel to Mr. Fiance's apartment and tells him that Mr. Fiance is out of town right now. It's cool. You can lay low here. I got the keys. I got everything you need. Don't worry. Just hang out here and don't talk to anyone. Daniel trusts Richard and he listens to him, but unfortunately... Richard doesn't trust Daniel and so before his son-in-law returns to his apartment Richard decides that the best thing to do is just to go ahead and get rid of Daniel too so he doesn't have to be worried or stressed or concerned about somebody else betraying him and when Mr. Fiance returns home there is a body in his apartment and uh Richard is like yeah this was a friend of mine I brought him here because he was in trouble with the law and somebody must have broken in and did this to him over the weekend and so he enlists Mr. Fiance's help to dispose of Daniel and he tells him like that's the best thing to do to avoid any trouble with the police because they may look at him because it's his apartment just manipulative it's his apartment they may look at him like it's just the best thing to do is just to keep quiet so you don't get in trouble for this Mr. Fiance helps him and then afterward Richard urges him to just just forget about the whole situation just pretend this never happened but Richard makes the mistake of admitting to one of his other colleagues that he had actually done this to Daniel like he I guess he just wanted credit for all of his work and so he could not help but to brag a couple months later Daniel is found on May 14th 1983 when a cyclist riding down Clinton Road in a wooded area of New Jersey spotted the corpse being preyed upon by a turkey vulture medical examiners listed his COD as undetermined although they did notice like pinkish spots on the skin which is a 
sign of cyanide poisoning. Investigators also made a note that Daniel had been discovered just three miles from a ranch where Richard and his family often went horseback riding. And so that made them just, just a little bit suspicious. Like, girl, did you have something to do with this too or not? This also raised a red flag because this is now the third associate of Richard's to have been found dead. So things weren't looking good for y'all's Aries brother. Earlier, I mentioned that in order to keep things tight, Richard really avoided any kind of after work, outside of work socialization. He kept his work life, his home life completely separate. And then I mentioned a little bit after that, that he began to get a little sloppy. This is, a, this is an example of how he was getting a little sloppy. He meets a guy by the name of Robert Prong and the two hit it off Brennan and Dale style. Did we just become best friends? Yep. You want to go do karate in the garage? Yup. They have a lot in common. They're in the same line of work. They're equally depraved and crazy. And they just, they become best friends. Richard gives his new bestie, Robert, the nickname Mr. Softy because he would ride around in a Mr. Softy ice cream truck in an effort to appear inconspicuous. Look at me using big words. Inconspicuous. Conspicuous. while he was out scouring and prowl on the prowl for future victims. Robert claimed to be a special forces veteran and he knew a lot about poison and he was more than happy to pass on this knowledge to Richard who was already really into like cyanide and poisoning and all of that stuff. The two linked up and they carried out a lot of jobs together. Like they would team up, carry out their jobs as a twosome and it was actually Robert's suggestion to begin freezing the bodies and disposing of them later to see if they could try to conceal the timeline in which the offense had occurred. This became Richard's favorite trick for disposal. Robert gifted him this huge industrial sized freezer and he would then take his victims, throw them in the freezer, leave them there for like two years, two years and then thaw them out and dump them like months later. When the police would find them, they would appear recently deceased and it kind of would just really throw them off. This technique earned Richard Kuklinski the nickname, the Iceman. Now they messed up on one instance. Louis M, I don't want to butcher his last name. I don't know how to pronounce it. He was a, a businessman who was due to meet Richard to purchase a large quantity of VCR tapes for a total of $100,000. But just like the deal with the pharmacist, things went bad. Richard could not be trusted. Richard flipped the script and went rogue. The deal went bad. It was a scam. The two ambushed Lewis and they placed Lewis in one of their freezers. On September 25th, 1983, Lewis is found near a park in Orangetown, New York. This was two years after the deal had gone wrong with Robert and Richard and they froze him. However, Richard made the mistake of not allowing Lewis to thaw out completely before he dumped him off. And Lewis was completely wrapped up in these trash bags, which kept him insulated and partially frozen. Now, Lewis was discovered on a warm September day and the medical examiners found ice crystals in his body. So they were like, wait. This of course raised a major red flag with the medical examiner who stated that had Richard completely thawed him out before throwing him out, he never would have suspected anything suspicious had occurred or anything, you know, any foul play was afoot. Another mistake that the two made was not changing Lewis's clothes. Detectives noticed right off that he was still wearing the clothes that he was reported missing in over two years ago. And so they were like, you know what? Mm, yeah, this just didn't happen to sis. This been, been gone. Like this just did not just happen to to this man. And as good as Richard and Robert had been working together up until this point, the two men fall out when Robert asks Richard to take care of his ex-wife and his son. And Richard refuses. Remember, no women, no children. Robert wanting to get rid of his ex-wife and his son, it really rubbed Richard the wrong way. Like he was disgusted and he began to not like Robert so much. And he was really, really turned off by Robert when he learned of Robert's plans to poison an entire reservoir just to take out one family on a job. And it's like, you're gonna, you're gonna like this would have affected a hell of a lot of people. Richard really didn't like that idea. He thought 
that it was ridiculous to take out a bunch of people and it was just he felt just like it just was lazy and ridiculous and he just wasn't down with it he confronts robert about this and the two get into an argument a really really bad argument in which robert tells richard that he knows where his family lives he threatens their safety and uh we know that didn't work out well for the last guy who threatened robert's family and his his safety child. Needless to say, on August 10th, 1984, Robert is found in his Mr. Softy truck with two bullet wounds to the chest. At the time that he was discovered, he was actually scheduled to appear in court on aggravated assault charges against his ex-wife and son. And so this is why he was trying to hurry up and get rid of them, like before the court date, before they could testify against him and he could go to jail where he belonged to be. And investigators actually regarded Richard as the prime suspect, but decided not to press charges. Up until this point, Richard has gotten away with every damn thing you can do to break the law, like everything. Name it, sis has done it and not not going to jail for it but all of that was about to change his undoing was due to phil solomon i believe it's pronounced solomon which was the closest thing he had to a friend after you know he had he had offed all of the others he had known phil the entire time that he was working for the mafia so this is over like almost 30 years now phil was a mafia man and he played no games now remember percy who had gotten locked up and turned informant well, he had been working with a detective by the name of Pat Kane, silently in the background linking Richard to five homicides. Paul, the pharmacist, Gary Smith, the one that they stuffed between the mattress and the box spring, Daniel, the other associate that he had taken down to Mr. Fiance's apartment and gotten rid of, Louis, the guy that they found ice crystals still inside of, and George, the guy that had threatened his family in the car, all of which really were easy to link toward Richard because he was the last person known to be seen with these guys. Now, the New Jersey Criminal Justice Department, they put together this special little task force composed of federal, state, and local law enforcement dedicated to arresting and convicting Richard of all of these crimes that he was walking around here carrying out. The task force was named Operation Iceman, honey. They had a whole whole name out here in these streets amen in 85 they began working with phil who was the longtime mafia associate of richard and they already had percy who was you know the informant in prison child they had that girl already on the line they were collecting all of their testimonies all of their evidence against richard now the first thing they did was use an undercover detective to purchase a weapon from richard after that the detective is earning the trust of Richard and then he tells him that he wants to hire him to take a hit out on another man in a whole cocaine deal robbery style type of type of thing. He records Richard agreeing to do it and describing how he would do it in full detail and asking the undercover detective if he could supply him with some cyanide. On the tapes, Richard was boasting about how he had put cyanide in someone's hamburger before and how that was his preferred method and that he could, you know, he was the guy, if anybody was the guy to get this done, he was just boasting and running down his resume, honey, just telling on himself. He also revealed that he had a plan to take out a couple of rats. Barbara, Daniel's wife, and Percy, who by this time was he had already, you know, he had already known was moving kind of shady. So he had plans of, you know, taking those two out for personal reasons. And he had no problem letting homeboy know up front, like, look, this is what I've done. And this is what I'm about to do. So I'm the guy for you, Bars. So more time goes by and then they make arrangements for Richard to come pick up the cyanide so he can carry out the hit. He is filmed making the transaction and unbeknownst to him he is still under surveillance when the two separate they watch him as he walks by himself to a park where he attempts to test the cyanide on a stray dog using a hamburger as bait and then he saw that like the dog wasn't affected that it was not it was not real poison and that he had been tricked baby the dog ate the hamburger and was excited and happy and healthy and looking for more 
And Richard was pissed. At that point, he decided, you know what? Something fishy is going on here. And he goes home instead of pursuing the hit because he was supposed to carry that out the same day. But once he saw that the, the cyanide wasn't cyanide, homeboy was like, you know what? I'm taking my ass home because something ain't right. He goes home, he gets with Barbara and the two get in the car. I believe they were on I believe they were on their way to get something to eat, but that's not really important. Anyway, the police pull the car over and he is apprehended. Barbara is also actually charged for the a gun being in the car. She was charged with possession of an illegal firearm and also trying to prevent Richard's arrest. Baby, I would have been pushing him out the car to the police. I would have been like, here he go, hitting the unlock. Girl, I would have been rolling down the window. If y'all got to pull him out through the window, by all means, go ahead and do so. Like, it would have been a wrap. Come get him, please. Come get him, please. But hell, they end up getting her too, so yeah. Barbara claimed to not know or have any idea what her husband had done to break the law, although she knew he wasn't a great guy. Like she said, she knew that he was a monster, but she had no idea or no knowledge about him being a secret hitman for the mafia. Sis said, baby, he did what? So who? He was charged in the five homicides that I mentioned before the following day and in 1988 he is found guilty of four of them he was later convicted for two more and then given two life sentences to be run consecutively not concurrently they said mm -mm, sis not at the same time but back to back when he was sent to prison him and his brother Joseph the one who had thrown the young girl off of the top of the building they were actually put on the same cell block, but reportedly, honey, there was no brotherly love because they didn't get along or care for each other at all. Baby, if I go to jail and my sister's already there, I'm walking in, we're gonna be like, what's up, my girl? But uh, we're a lot different than these two, obviously. Now, after his arrest, Richard was not shy at all. He liked all of the attention he received. He gave countless interviews to psychiatrists he gave them to prosecutors he gave them to reporters criminologists news reporters journalists pretty much anybody who wanted an interview from him except for oprah and uh geraldo he reportedly denied their request for interviews i don't know what that was about but it allegedly happened he participated in two documentaries about his life and spoke very candidly about what he had done and why. If you've seen the Iceman tapes on HBO, that's, that's him. That's what these are about. I haven't seen it and I probably won't. According to his daughter Merrick, his, his, the apple of his eye, his sweet little Merrick, it was her mother Barbara who convinced Richard to do all of these interviews and participate in this documentary and said that her mother, Barbara, was paid very handsomely for him participating in these interviews. There's also a 2012 film called The Iceman based on Richard Kuklinski. I haven't seen it. I'm pretty sure somebody in the comments has seen it. You know what? If there's a movie about these people that I have not seen, I never go back and watch them because by the time I finish reading and researching all of this and watching like interview tapes and news news coverage i just i'm over it his daughter merrick was particularly offended by the portrayal of her father in the Iceman, and she allegedly got a little spicy with the actress that played her mother winona ryder telling her if the character you played had actually been my mother then my childhood would have been different it's like girl i didn't write this i'm just here to act out the lines I don't make the news, I just report it. That's what I would have told Miss Merrick if I was Winona Ryder. Now, in one of his interviews for TV, Richard said, quote, I've never felt bad for anything I've done other than hurting my family. I do want my family to forgive me. Barbara divorced Richard in 1993, five years into his prison sentence. She said that the divorce was for money reasons, but she continued to visit him in prison at least once a year. Now, while in prison, Richard developed this very rare disease called Kawasaki disease. And from what I read, it only typically affects Japanese children. I don't know why child i don't know why but it also just so happens to mimic the symptoms of mercury poisoning now keep in mind this was after he had done all of these interviews exposing mob secrets and telling about all of the jobs he carried out like running his mouth and talking too much on tv in front of the world so it's widely believed that he was actually poisoned 
and he didn't have Kawasaki disease at all. Right before his death, he was actually scheduled to appear in court and testify against Sammy the Bull. And he had told his family that he believed he was being poisoned, but it really was nothing that the prison was willing to do to try to help him, child. It was just like, are you being poisoned? Okay. However, after Richard did die, charges were brought up against Sammy the Bull for the hit, but they were eventually dropped due to lack of evidence that couldn't prove that he had put the hit out on Richard or child. They just didn't care. One of the two. But I've jumped a little here because I didn't already told y'all about after Richard's death. Let's just rewind it back. Let's just, just, just roll back a little bit. Richard had begun to get sick around the 18 year mark of his prison sentence. And once he began to get sick, honey, his, his health just rapidly declined like really fast. The incurable inflammation of the blood vessels, which is what Kawasaki disease is, required Richard to be transferred to a hospital where little Miss Barber would get to see him one last time. Laying on his death bed in and out of consciousness, Richard, afraid for his life, asked the doctors to please revive him should he flatline. But Barbara, on her way out, signed a do not resuscitate form. Talk about a bitch getting the last laugh. Oh. When he got really bad, like a week before he died, they called her at home and they asked, hey, do you want to change your mind? Because it's looking kind of bad. And she said, nope, she does not want to change her mind. Do not resuscitate. Richard Kuklinski went into cardiac arrest on March 5th, 2006 at the age of 70. And at the request of Barbara, his next of kin was not resuscitated. And that is the end of his story. And this is the finished look. I hope you enjoyed them both. If you did, please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. I'm gonna give you time right now, girl. Go on and give my video a thumbs up if you liked it, please. Comment down below. Let me know your thoughts. Share this video with a friend. As always, I appreciate you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Peace. One of the beatings actually resulted in a pearl shrimp. And as far as Richard as a father, Barbara described him. God damn it. This was one of the only times that Richard Klu This was one of the only times that Richard Klu Now this was the first directly linked to Richard Klu Now this was the first directly linked to Richard Klu They also used an undetective undetective Share this video with a threat with a friend